today in REM 456 Integrated Range Management, I'm going to talk about some of the principles about how plants respond to grazing. Uh, this is in a series of uh, topics that relate to how plants respond to grazing and fire based on morphological and physiological aspects of plants. So here are some basic principles. First of all, grazing resistance has a very specific name in ecological literature. It means anything that enables plants to survive grazing. There's two ways a plant can survive grazing. That would be to either avoid grazing in the first place. So any mechanisms that reduce the probability of grazing are called avoidance mechanisms. Then any mechanisms that just simply help the plant tolerate or get over being grazed, that those are called tolerance mechanisms. So again, we divide grazing resistance into avoidance and tolerance mechanisms. And I'm going to go through each of those, starting with avoidance. One way that plants avoid being grazed is through morphological attributes or mechanical features, such as thorns, prickles, spines. Uh, of course, they look really dangerous to us, like um, when they're on a, a cactus like this, they affect the skin defense system, cause animals to stay away. Oftentimes animals are more tolerant of pain like this than we might think and uh, they may not be as effective in, unless they're really a strong deterrent. And then prickles or spines which might not affect large animals may be fairly effective on insects. Even hairs on the plant leaf can reduce herbivory by, by uh, insects. In some cases, these defenses can even be inducible. In previous lectures, we looked at short-stemmed plants, plants that shorten the internode distance um, to become less accessible to grazers, or they can make their uh, thorns longer. So a, a plant might have a certain length of thorn, and after it starts to be grazed, the subsiding thorns will become longer, the subsequent thorns. Other ways that plants can avoid being grazed, of course, the plant parts can be changed uh, spines, awns, pubescence, or that's hair on the leaf. We know that as plants become older or as they mature, they become less nutritious. That also serves as a defense mechanism, a way to avoid grazing. Uh, as the leaf to stem ratio decreases, plants become more desirable and so they tend to be avoided. As the live tissue decreases and the dead tissue increases as a ratio in the plant, those plants will become less desirable. And then finally, some plants have a lot of reproductive tillers compared to vegetative tillers, so a lot of stems that have flower stalks on them instead of leaves. And as you increase that ratio of reproductive to vegetative tillers, plants become less desirable and they tend to um, serve as avoidance mechanisms. Plants also vary in how hard they are to cut or how hard they are to shear, so shear strength of a leaf or stem is based on the chemical features in the cells, the cell walls, how thick the cells wa cell walls are, and what they're made of. Of course, if they're lignified or not. Lignified cell walls are stronger and, and have higher tinsel strength. And then if, they, if the plant cell walls have silica, that can also increase the shear strength. And in studies, you can measure the shear strength and relate that to how likely an animal is to eat a plant. So that's a measure of avoidance. Other morphological features then, attributes of the plant that change how likely it is to be grazed. Uh, the growth form can affect the um, how likely something is to be grazed. Bunch grasses tend to be easier for an animal to take a full bite on, so they often have lower avoidance than uh, plants that have a prostrate growth form or um, sod grasses. Plant size is also important. Uh, if a plant is really large and apparent, um, animals may be more likely to eat it. On the other hand, if it's really large, um, it'll be hard for animals to really get a, a full bite of it. So animals tend to like foods that are of just the right size for them to get one healthy bite. So plants that are too small or too large can serve as avoidance mechanisms. The location of meristem. So think about this. It's not just whether the animal eats or avoids eating the plant, but also if the if the plant is able to successfully protect its meristem. So if a plant has mechanisms to protect meristem, such as keeping them low to the ground or high from the ground or protecting them with mechanical features, that would serve as an avoidance mechanism. I mentioned this earlier, but live to dead ratio um, is also important. Some plants actually 
uh, will quickly mature a, a certain set of stems and then that will serve as a uh, avoidance mechanism for the, the columns or the shoots that come afterwards. Thinking about avoidance mechanisms, here is an example of those growing points. Remember, we've seen this chart before, or this uh, figure before. At the very base of this plant, so this is a young grass, and those meristems are at the base of the plant, so that's um, keeping the meristems out of the reach of herbivores. And so that's a way of protecting the growth points, and again, that's an avoidance mechanism. Uh, when plants become uh, very shrubby, uh, hedged growth forms, such as this curly mountain mahogany, um, the, when the plant was grazed, it, it creates a lot of those axillary buds um, that form stems and it protects the leaves. And again, that's a way of avoidance. So avoidance mechanisms can also be chemical in nature rather than mechanical. They can be compounds in the plant that um, reduce the probability of herbivory, or they tend to allow the, the plant to avoid being grazed. Well, how do those work? Well, the first set of mechanisms are those that simply decrease the benefit of the plant. So if it's not really nutritious, plants have lower preference or lower palatability and animals will graze them. So remember, it's not, the in, the, it's not always the characteristics of one individual plant, but it's whether it will be grazed relative to other plants around it. So if it's just a little bit less palatable or a little less digestive, that plant um, could avoid grazing. So we've talked a little bit about secondary chemicals and how they can have uh, a negative feedback through the gut defense system and create an aversion. So that would be, again, an avoidance mechanism, a biochemical way that the plant can reduce the probability of being grazed and serve as an avoidance mechanism. So again, grazing resistance has both avoidance and tolerance, and each of those features can be either morphological in nature or biochemical. We're going to talk now about tolerance. Uh, morphological features that influence tolerance include the leaf, pro, uh, re, the leaf replacement potential. Some plants are just more able to produce leaves. The leaves might be thinner. They're just more able to activate the cells and really re replace leaf material at a much faster rate. That's known as leaf, rate, leaf replacement potential and its uh, response to tolerance. Again, tolerance is when a plant is able to survive or regrow after grazing. Meristematic potential for regrowth is when a plant leaves its meristems out of reach so that they can really be activated and quickly respond to grazing. Some plants are just better at this than others. Their meristems can be easily activated and they are, not, they are um, said to have high meristematic potential. Um, I, before we think too much about physiological fa factors, just remember how the plant um, translocates carbon. The, all, at the basis of the ways that plants tolerate grazing is uh, an understanding of where carbon is in the plant. So um, the carbon, of course, is uh, produced in the leaves. That's the source of these carbons through photosynthesis. And the carbon is needed after grazing then to reestablish photosynthetic material so that the plant can keep on photosynthesizing or to produce seeds. Um, the sink of carbon then is in the roots. And when a plant is grazed or at any time, uh, the carbon is used for root growth and the excess is stored in the roots in the crown. So that excess source of carbon or stored carbon is at the basis for how plants can really um, tolerate grazing or recover after grazing. Um, compensatory photosynthesis is an interesting feature we talked about earlier. It's when one part of the plant is grazed, the remaining leaves will increase their photosynthetic rate. So that's the way to really mobilize and create more carbon in order to reestablish more photosynthetic material and promote root growth. Root growth. Uh, uh, and then when that stored carbon is in the roots, carbon allocation patterns differ among plants. Some plants are just really a lot more able to mobilize the carbon that they have, especially that stored carbon. Remember, carbon is stored as a starch, and some plants have a really high metabolic ability for taking that starch, turning it into sugars, which can be used to um, give energy to the plant and um, create more photosynthetic material. So the bottom of line in physiological mechanisms of how plants tolerate grazing is how they're able to allocate and store carbohydrates. An interesting way to look at this is um, plants that are fairly good at um, tolerating grazing are ones that 
after their graves, they take the carbon that they have and they um, focus on, on blade growth as opposed to root growth or shoot growth. So when a plant is defoliated, it reallocates its carbon towards the blade. So here's an example of research that was done by Detling and others um, out of Colorado State. And they were looking at blue grama. They had some undefoliated plants. That's the top row on this chart. And that you can look at how much of the total um, milligrams of carbon in this case um, were used by for blade growth, sheath, sheath growth, or root growth. 33% was used to the blade. When the plant was defoliated, then 53% of the carbon was used for um, the blade growth, and a lesser amount was used for shoot and root. So the bottom line is, when a plant is grazed, some plants are really able to take that carbon and reallocate it to blade growth so that the plant can reestablish photosynthetic material and go on. It's really important to think about how um, photosynthesis is going on in the leaves and contributing to root growth. And this is just kind of a rule of thumb. You might have heard this leave, take half, leave half. Um, I often like to say in our part of the world, it's, that's a little high, so maybe take some, leave more is better because of the plants that we have. But here's some diagrams of plants that were from the plains where a take half, leave half is a pretty good, um, a pretty good a way of thinking about how much you can defoliate a plant before you reduce root growth. So in the diagram, it's pretty clear. When there was 0% defoliation, look at the roots, how long and healthy they are. At 50% defoliation, you're starting to see less root growth, 70% way less, and at 90% defoliation, very little root growth in that plant on the far right. The chart that is listed then in that graph shows that at 50%, you usually have very minimum root stoppage, growth of uh, reduced rate of uh, root growth. When you hit 60%, now you start to have real differences. So the kind of the difference between the chart and the figure, it might just be a difference in plants. Uh, some plants, 60% will start to really have a strong effect on root growth and 40 will have none. Others, 40% will start to have an effect. So bottom line is somewhere between 40 and 50%, we usually start to see reduced root growth. Root response to defoliation, uh, again, as, as you reduce the amount of photosynthetic material above the ground, you're going to reduce the growth rate. Again, removal of greater than 50% usually is required in the plant leaf area before you start to see significant reduction in root growth. It's, it's not just the amount of defoliation, though. It, it can also be the frequency that affects the amount of root growth. So the, if, if a plant is intensely defoliated, or if that defoliation happens over and over again at a higher frequency, then root growth can be diminished. So those two things act in combination. And there's kind of a, a common rule in range mantra that, that you, know, you never want to graze the same plant twice. And, and that's where this, this comes from, that idea that the intensity of defoliation is important, but also the frequency of defoliation is important. So the effects of grazing on plants, sort of in summary, the removal of photosynthetic tissue does reduce the plant's ability to take in energy and assimilate energy for new material. Removal of meristems can really delay or even stop growth um, because those meristems will have to be activated to increase growth. So if they're moved, if they are removed, then uh, it takes longer for the plant to recover. Uh, the removal of reproductive flowers and stems can also reduce the plant's ability to produce new individuals. It really depends on how late in senescence the plant is. But if you have flowers, that is removing a meristematic area, and the plant will have to reestablish a tiller if, if it's that um, early in the seed production rate. But remember, grazing is a natural ecological process in all rangelands, and it helped them well before humans started trying to figure out what levels of grazing should occur. So it's a, it's a natural process that these plants have, have evolved with, and they have mechanisms to deal with defoliation. Properly managed grazing lands, grazing lands can be very sustainably done, uh, and very little destruction can happen if the manager is well-informed and observant of the process. I guess the flip side of that could be said, too, that an un, uh, uncontrolled grazing can really lead to damage of roots and reduced recovery and loss of photosynthetic material that reduces the plant's ability to survive grazing. Again, grazing resistance divided into avoidance and tolerance. 
and each of those has morphological and biochemical or physical physiological features. The summary is just always remember that plant morphology is dependent on the plant type what its grazing history was, and just its species. So some plants are more able to tolerate grazing than others. And the same with physiological mechanisms. Some plants have mechanisms to more easily reestablish carbon after defoliation than others. We have some general rules, uh, but they're very dependent on place, on the amount of resources available, and about on the plant. So perhaps the answer to how do plants tolerate grazing is that we have some general principles, but it depends. So throughout this class, we'll keep prying into what it depends on. Affects tolerance and avoidance, and uh, the same with physio physiology.